I'm pleased to introduce today our speaker, uh, Dr. Rob Sanderson uh, from Yale University. Um, many of you will know Rob uh, from his work on standards, um, including the International, in uh, International Image Interoperability Framework, which I think Rob is the man who can say that <laughs> over it, uh, or shortening to AAAF, also W3C uh, Web Annotation Standards, and Jason LB. Uh, which are all things and technologies that many of us are now using day to day, so have a really significant uptake and implementation around the world. Um, today Rob will be take, talking to us about his experience working on these technologies and how they led to something uh, called linked art, uh, which is sort of the new thing, as I like to think of it, in, in, in this space. Um, personally, just under five years ago, I think it was actually remarkably, uh, when Rob was in the Getty, uh, he approached me to join the Linked Arts editorial board, um, which I was incredibly pleased to do, uh, mostly because of the approach in that community, a uh, very pragmatic approach to technology and its use, and use for me really is the, the key word there, um, so that approach is right up my street. Since then, Rob has been a strong supporter of two AHRC-funded projects that we've run here in OERC on working on Linked Arts, um, and it's very pleasing from our point of view to then be able to use those projects to contribute in some small way back into realizing those goals of linked art. Uh, more recently, Rob joined Yale. It was one of those mid-pandemic <laughs> moves, which in hindsight <laughs> seems slightly surreal that that was even um, at all possible. And today, uh, he'll be talking about the absolutely brilliant work he's been doing there with colleagues on uh, linked art um, for the collections at Yale. Uh, meanwhile, here in OERC, we now have uh, a third linked art research project called Enriching Exhibition Scholarship, uh, which is working with Rob and colleagues at Yale, alongside Claire Luwani at Edinburgh. Uh, and it's also wonderful that that project is now direct collaboration uh, with our colleagues at the Ashmolean. That project, Enriching Exhibition Scholarship, is a research project looking at the research potential of linked art, particularly when combined uh, with computational analysis including um, of social media. And actually one of the things you'll see if you go to the Labyrinth exhibition that's currently running at the Ashmolean is some hashtags encouraging you to participate. And that's part of the research project um, that's going on and using linked art. And I'd also highly recommend, if you haven't caught it yet, uh, the Labyrinth exhibition. Um, today I'm pleased to say that Rob will be focusing on the practical sort of what, why, and how of linked art. Um, and I think that's absolutely crucially important because unless collections start implementing technologies such as linked art to be able to share that data, the research part, which is really what we're interested in here in OERC, can't happen at all. It really is uh, the absolute foundation that we need to get going with research using these collections. So with that, I'll pass over to Rob and preferences to take questions at the end and of the talk. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, please do, please do remember the questions as they, uh, uh, as they come up. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for such an um, overblown and uh, <laughs> overemphasized uh, introduction. Um, so, yeah, um, today, as, as Kevin said, I'd like to talk about uh, what we have learnt through the process of building AAAF, of building linked art, uh, and our application of those technologies at Yale um, and our cross collections discovery platform, which we call LUX. So, LUX is not an acronym, it's just the first uh, word in the university's motto LUX et veritas, light and truth. So, yes, I'll get that, uh, that question out of the way uh, first. <laughs> so, what is, what is LUX? So, we think, it's, uh, think of it as a groundbreaking uh, discovery platform um, that provides unified access to all of our collections ac across the university. So, both the libraries and archives and our three museums. It does that through linked data, and in particular linked art, uh, and we use AAAF for uh, access to the images. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, we have 17 million objects, so it's not a small scale uh, undertaking. Um, almost 5 million concepts or, or subjects, uh, more than 5 million people and organizations, um, half a million places, 13 million works. We just launched uh, externally on June 1st um, to some media uh, approval. So in thinking about what we wanted to do uh, at, with Lux, we realized uh, very early on that all of the cultural and natural heritage that uh, we steward at Yale is connected uh, to some degree. So we have uh, the Natural History Museum, Yale Peabody Museum, we have two art museums, uh, the YCBA and the Yale University Art Gallery, 
the uh, Beinecke rare book, which is a book library which is uh, depicted there, uh, and of course one of the largest research libraries uh, in North America. So in terms of the connections, I'll just give a, an example. This fish uh, was discovered by Benjamin Silliman, one of the early uh, chemistry professors at Yale College. He wrote this letter, which is in the archives, to George Peabody, uh, which then, who then uh, funded the Peabody Museum, and after whom it is named. Silliman was married to this lovely lady, Harriet Trumbull, whose uh, sketch is in the art gallery. Harriet Trumbull was the niece of John Trumbull, the painter who depicted many uh, revolutionary topics, including this one, uh, along with his mentor, Benjamin West, which is in the uh, Yale Center for British Art. So in terms of connecting our heritage, we wanted to have one system, one coherent connected system, rather than five different systems that you could search from a single search box. Um, so we, we need this one knowledge base for uh, the experience of the user to be even remotely acceptable. Of course, the issue then is we want to have one record for Trumbull, one record for Solomon, uh, one record for London, for Oxford, for Yale. Meaning we need to then reconcile you know, this record in the library is the same as, or refers to the same entity as this record in the archives as in the museums. We found it easiest to do that not by connecting the records directly, but by using uh, the external authorities uh, that those organisations uh, are used to using. So in the museums, they use uh, the Getty vocabularies, uh, AAT and ULAN and TGN, whereas in the library, they use the Library of Congress um, equivalents, uh, the Library of Cong Congress subject headings, the Library of Congress name authority files. We could then connect uh, from our records to those and then connect through Wikidata and other um, external authorities to complete the circle uh, to then reconcile the, the records. Once we'd reconciled uh, all of the records, we could then enrich our knowledge from those external data sets because all of the knowledge is linked and, and open. So on the, um, the right hand side there you see uh, a collector, um, the, but, uh, the portrait is from the, from the art gallery. Uh, we only, of course, maintain his name in English, James White Dana, and we've enriched the record with his names from, in other languages from other systems. This happens in a completely automated way, um, with 41 million records, of course, it would take years for even students to uh, go through and, and click, 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 click. So we think this is game-changing for the sector. Um, as far as we know, it's unique uh, it's at this sort of scale and with this, uh, this sort of technology, using um, knowledge graphs to make uh, the connections between records and across different systems. We've had both deep and widespread interest already in the last couple of weeks uh, from many peer organisations, both in cultural heritage sector uh, and in higher ed. Why are we doing this at Yale? Well, it does fulfil the mission of the university directly. Um, it uh, improves access to the collections. You know, as a cultural heritage organisation, you know, we have a responsibility to both preserve and make accessible uh, the collections that we steward. And to, to do that digitally is much easier than to do it physically. Particularly at New Haven, which is not right next to a major airport hub. But it also um, increases uh, access to the collections for teaching and learning. So we've been working with faculty uh, to ensure that Lux is used uh, in their coursework. Um, and already we've had uh, faculty come to us and say, this is amazing. You know, previously we had to go to five, six, ten different databases to find what uh, we should use in our courses. Now we can go, go to one place and get access to it directly. But because of the knowledge graph and because of the enriched data that we uh, maintain, it also improves research at the university. So those same um, faculty said, I can see how I can use this in my day-to-day -day research life. How did we do this? Collaboration is, of course, at the top of the list. There was no way that we could have done this uh, alone with only one museum or only one, uh, one library or even just within uh, ITS. We had more than 100 people um, contributing directly to the project over the past five years. So not 500 person years, that uh, would not pass muster at Yale, um, but certainly um, a lot of people over a lot of time. Uh, and that then led to generosity uh, because people were then working with colleagues who they uh, hadn't before 
and uh, that made them feel more accountable for their actions and for the outcomes, which then of course led to the excellence of the result. It is sophisticated technology under the hood. Uh, it's a knowledge graph, not just a regular database. Um, so connecting um, records together through semantic relationships um, in a triple store, rather than something like Sol or Elasticsearch. And of course, a lot of hard work um, by a lot of people. So enough rhetoric about Lux. Let's give you a demo so you can see it um, in action. This is not just slide wheel. So we'll search for Trumbull. You know, of course, we have the, the Google style, you know, type in a bunch of keywords, do a bunch of uh, relevance ranked um, queries to come to the initial list. But across the top, you'll see these tabs. So these are the, the classes of, um, of records that we have. So objects, which are physical or digital things in our collection. Works, so these are works um, related to Trumbull in some degree. Often uh, bibliographic records uh, or um, archival records. People and groups, so we have records for each of the, uh, the people and organizations in the system, uh, including you know, John Trumbull at the top, but also John Trumbull uh, and John Trumbull, his son. Uh, they're all part of the same Trumbull family. Um, these two were governors of Connecticut as opposed to um, the other son uh, who was uh, the artist. Places, uh, there's Trumbull County in Ohio, Fort Trumbull, uh, and a bunch of other um, locations. Concepts, often subjects from um, the library, such as uh, Victoria Trumbull, the fictitious character, presentation description from Trumbull, and, and so on. And events. So at the moment, uh, the events in the system are mostly exhibitions, uh, whereby we can then link back to the uh, objects that were exhibited um, either at Yale or um, objects from Yale that were exhibited elsewhere. We can do uh, faceting, as you would expect. Um, so you know, digital image only, so here is archival records. Can facet by types um, or by dates. Oops, that wouldn't have worked. And yep, now we've reduced that um, initial set down to a much more manageable uh, set of results. So just with this you know, intuitive basic interface, you, know, you can already start to drill down within the collections to see uh, what we have. I'll come back to advanced search uh, towards the end. Well, let's look at this one. So this is when we use AAAF. Uh, so this is a, uh, a miniature um, of uh, Faith Trumbull, the, one of the daughters, so uh, the sister of Harriet Trumbull. Uh, it's about an inch and a half high, um, but with AAAF and high quality digitization, you can lean into the object uh, much more than you possibly could uh, in reality. You know, if you put your nose right up against the the miniature, which is what you'd have to do to get this view. In reality, the uh, Yale University uh, security guards would be coming and tapping you on the shoulder, I'm sure. Of course, we have the regular tombstone record um, with uh, you know, what sort of object is it, what's it made of, who created it, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But because we have the records for people, instead of this being a link to a search for other objects by Trumbull, when we go to John Trumbull, we see the record for Trumbull. And we can then use that as a hub to go out back to the collection um, uh, on this left-hand side, or information um, about Trumbull on the right-hand side. So there was a pistol that he owned in our collection, um, objects that he created, uh, works that he created. So um, if he wrote pamphlets that are in our um, archives or books, they would be in, in here, or of course, as a famous figure, there are works about Trumbull, either visual uh, or further down on the list, there's um, textual works. We further leverage the relationships uh, by exposing all of the concepts that are related to Trumbull, such as his tomb or bibliography of his catalogues, catalogues of his works, a production timeline, and in the next iteration, this will really be a timeline rather than a, a list of dates. 
And the one that we're perhaps most proud of is, uh, is this one. So with related people, uh, we can find folks who have worked somehow or are related to Trumbull in some way through the collection objects. So, for example, Washington. George Washington is the subject of works that are also about uh, Trumbull. And he is um, credited as contributor, as, uh, yeah, contributor to works along with Trumbull. He created works about Trumbull and so on. Or further down, here's uh, Benjamin West. Right? So Benjamin West is the subject of works about the person and is the subject of works created by Trumbull and created objects with Trumbull. So if we go here, here is the painting uh, from my slide uh, that's in the, in the YCPA. So we think that using and, and leveraging these um, relationships between records, we can really expose these hidden connections that you couldn't otherwise see because they're, you know, they're through uh, the, the collection rather than individually between the, between the people. Then on the right hand side here uh, is the enriched record uh, for Trumbull himself, including names in different languages, um, where and, and when he was born, where and when he died, nationality, gender, roles, occupations, he was a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and, and so forth. We've tried to cite our sources as much as possible. <coughs> um, every record is openly available um, from, from Yale. Here are the contributing records uh, from our systems and the external ones that we've reconciled with and enriched the record from. Of course, we also have places. <coughs> so he, was, uh, he died in New York. Map to give context. The same on the left-hand side of you know, how, do, how does New York relate to the collection? How does New York relate to other concepts and people and, uh, and object types? So let's look at uh, object types briefly. So these are the types of objects that are uh, related to New York. Either they were encountered there, created there, published there, and, and so on. Interestingly, sugar tongs. So there are 178 sugar tongs in our collection from New York. I don't know, maybe one of the curators really loves sweet coffee or something. But. So you know, here is a, one of the bugs from the automation where there's a, a, a loop in the vocabulary uh, hierarchy. So it's uh, is a little bit extensive there. But yeah, the concept for, for sugar tongs then has the same features as all of the other enriched records. So we have different names for sugar tongs um, in descriptions in different languages and the references back into the collection um, so you can get from the concept to the objects that it relates to it. So let me show you the advanced search just to demonstrate the connectedness um, of the system. So one of the issues um, with using a, a graph uh, is that it's hard to bring the user to understand how they can leverage the knowledge in the graph, right? because you have to understand the relationships. And in many systems, uh, such as ones that expose a sparkle endpoint, you have to know the data model. What we've tried to do is abstract that data model, and I'll talk about this in the rest of the slides, um, a little bit, so that the user doesn't have to be an expert. Uh, you, know, you don't need a PhD in query optimization of Sparkle queries in order to use, to use this. So, for example, we're looking for objects that have all of the fields. Uh, name of each, and the object should be categorized as an archival object and it should have a digital image. And then I did that, sorry, I did that too fast. So when you hover over any of the relationships, it tries to give you contextual help on the right hand side there. So it has digital, uh, 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 yep. Search for objects which, for which digital, digital images are available. And uh, images um, from, oh, did I not click? I did not, haha, <laughs> I cleared it. Turn that digital image back on, yes. All right. Objects with images from the archives of beaches. Now, if that doesn't make you wish for summer, I don't know what will. So um, to further show the connectedness across um, collections, would be a more complicated one that leverages the, the links. 
So we're looking for objects that uh, carry a work, so either a, a textual work or an image, and that work is about a person or, a, or an organization that then encountered some object. So by encountered, what I, you might have previously heard people say discovered, but oftentimes they didn't really discover it, they just encountered it. Someone else found it a long time ago, it just wasn't in any information system in the Western world. So we use the term encountered. So they, uh, objects that have a work about someone who encountered some, uh, some object, probably now in the, in the Peabody Museum, uh, and that object should be categorized as a holotype. So now we're really in the Peabody's domain. Um, holotypes are those specimens that define the species. So uh, the Peabody has several dinosaur holotypes, you know, the specimen that defines Taurosaurus or um, Pterodactyl. And we get um, a list of works either in the library or the um, museums that are about people who found um, uh, holotypes uh, in the Peabody. Or we can, it's a demo, so we should turn on uh, only those with digital images and we filter down to the portraits in the Yale University Art Gallery of people who found um, the holotypes in the Peabody. Okay, I'll go back to my slides. So, AAAF. I'm not going to explain AAAF. I'm happy to at some other point. Um, that's not the, the point of today's talk. Um, so, however, one thing about AAAF is its design principles. So, as Kevin said, we've focused really on the usability of the data, because if something isn't usable, it won't get used. If it's not used, why did we do it? Why did we invest millions of dollars to do something that no one ever actually wants? So these principles have really guided the way that we have developed AAAF over the past uh, 12 years, um, starting at the top with the most important of shared use cases. Right? If there's no use case, why we don't need to do it. Right? It's out of scope. Um, it should be international, of course. You know, we want this to be uh, as, as usable and used as possible, so why would we limit to only English? It should be as simple as possible, but no simpler, sometimes uh, misattrib misattributed to Einstein. Uh, so if there is something which is complex, yeah, that's great if it's possible, uh, but we want to keep things as simple as we can. But if there's something that's required, something that we can um, validate via a use case, and that requires a bit more complexity, then that's the but no simpler point. Right? Don't reduce everything down to 15 fields from uh, Dublin Core. Uh, avoid dependency on specific technologies, designed for JSON-LD, and, uh, and so on. So what happens if we were to apply those principles to linked open data? And that's essentially what we've tried to do in, in linked art. The first question, of course, is who is doing the use of the data? And my argument is it is not the researcher. The researcher doesn't use linked data directly unless they're a digital humanist. Instead, there is a, a software engineer um, a developer who takes that data and builds something with it that the researcher then uses. So, yes, that could be one person, right, if you squashed the um, middle and, uh, and right hand people together, but by and large, we want to be focusing on how does a software engineer use data uh, to build things that researchers can then use to do their job. So, linked up then um, is a, a metadata profile, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Uh, which is collaboratively designed. Um, you know, Kevin is, uh, is part of the community that, that works on this, um, but also uh, probably 20 or 30 other people uh, over the past couple of years have contributed um, directly to the work. And the design principles, that, you know, the top four really are focus on usability um, per AAAF and consistently solve challenges from actual data. So one of the issues that we've found in the linked uh, data world is that people propose, wouldn't it be great if, scenarios. You know, oh, I've got this one record that has this feature, and I really want to make that available in the ontology. Like, well, okay, we can do that, but at what cost? So we want to solve 90% of the shared use cases, 
not 100%, because that last 10% takes 90% of the effort. Or here's another way to, to think about it. I, I debated putting um, labels on all the people, but then thought, I'm not going to. I'm just going to explain what their role is, because in different domains, you'd have very different labels on these people. So the, uh, the top left people are the, you might think of them as curators or catalogers or archivists, the folks who understand the domain. These people, is my mouse visible? Yep. These people are working with the database, so collections information access, or the technical services in the library, or the uh, technical services and archives who deal with archive space. And then this person is a software engineer who is building a client um, that then the researcher uses. So this researcher has, or you know, anyone really doesn't need to be a researcher, has some information need that they want to uh, ask about this object which is described by the curators and managed in the database. So the first question is, does the questioner's mental model of what they are thinking about align with the people who describe the objects with their mental model? If they don't align, there's a problem, right? Because you'll be asking you know, apples and getting oranges. Equally, do the data models align? Because you know, all of this interaction is mediated through technology. So if the, uh, the technical folks at the institution and the people building the client, if they, if they don't have the same understanding, um, then that's going to make a challenge as well. And clearly, there's this game of telephone from the curator through to the, uh, the researcher through uh, the technical staff. So we need standards. They need to reflect the domain and they need to be usable. What standards do we need? Well, at the conceptual layer, we need a conceptual model so that we can have the same overall worldview, um, uh, you know, an abstract way to think about the world in a, in a consistent, uh, consistent method. We then need to encode that uh, using a set of terms uh, in linked data, um, so an ontology. And then we need some vocabulary to make it more concrete and more specific to the domain. Right? So we want to have the notion of painting uh, as a vocabulary term and the notion of a physical thing as an ontology term. And then at the technical layer, uh, which is where Linked Art comes in, we have uh, a metadata profile, by which I mean it is a selection of the abstractions from the, the conceptual layer that then encodes the scope of what you want to talk about. So we've selected parts of the conceptual model that are relevant, we've selected the ontology terms, and we've selected uh, vocabulary terms to make it uh, specific to what we want to talk about. But if a different profile came along, they could use exactly the same conceptual layer, make different choices, and end up at a different profile. And then an API, application programming interface, is then a selection of appropriate technologies to give access to the data. So this is where the, um, the developer comes in. And the data model itself is very simple at, uh, from a 5,000 foot view. Instead of being object centric, it's activity centric. So uh, history and culture relies on human activity. Right? If uh, there were no humans, there would be no culture. So putting the activity in the center and then relating it to where it happened, when it happened, who did it, uh, what objects, be they either physical or conceptual, um, did it involve, what sort of uh, activity was it, and so on. We can then take that and stamp it repeatedly around uh, to form connections in, in the graph. And there's a problem with doing it this way, which we've hopefully solved, um, uh, which we'll talk about as part of the, the lessons that we've learned. So then what are the linked arts community's design principles? Well, the first one is, of course, hey, what IIIF said. Don't uh, go off and uh, reinvent uh, those ones. But the, the, the second one, or 11th one, uh, is don't fear the network. And this came from one of our colleagues at the Smithsonian uh, very early on. He said, don't worry about the connection between the browser and the database. Don't, you know, if that's making hundreds of requests, that's fine, because that's exactly what web browsers in the modern world are designed to do and they do it very efficiently and very well. Caches sit there in between the web browser and the, the server, between the server and the, um, and the database, that makes all of this efficient. And uh, I owe him many beers for, uh, for that particular uh, guidance. 
Um, similarly to AAAF, uh, so in AAAF there's a notion of level zero, which is you just put everything on disk and it works. Um, also in linked art we have the same concept, but we express it slightly differently. It must be easy to implement by hand for a single record. Right. Yeah, it's not going to be easy to implement by hand for 41 million records, that would take an awful long time. Uh, but if you just want to get started and see what happens, you should be able to fire up a text editor, write some JSON, put it on disk a, under Apache or some other web server and have it work. Um, to riff on the misattributed Einstein quote, it should be as normalized as possible but no more normalized. Uh, meaning every statement should be in only one record because if it's in multiple records, now you have a consistency problem when one of those records changes. Uh, if there are multiple references to something, then there has to be a separate record for that thing that is being referred to, because otherwise they, need, they would point to somewhere inside one of the other records, and that's no good. And relationships go only in one direction. This is sort of a uh, second step from each statement only lives in one record. So if you imagine a parent-child hierarchy, you could either say that you know, this object has a part which is the frame, or you could say this frame is part of a larger object, the overall painting. And we've decided that the child records should point to the parents and not vice versa. So the frame says, I'm part of this painting. The reason being books. Right? You don't want to say, I'm a book, I've got a thousand pages, and here they all are. Because then you're downloading all of these thousands of references which the um, front end likely doesn't need. Uh, and finally, there should be no uh, UR requirements on the way the URI is structured. So there is sort of a convention um, that people have put into place, but it's absolutely just a convention for humans to look at a URI and say, oh, that's a place, or that's an object, or that's a, uh, a person. So in Lux, uh, we've used the linked art model um, and those principles uh, in, in this way. So objects uh, show works. They can be about concepts, places, or people. People perform activities which take place at places, uh, including being born or died or carried out activities. Uh, objects are produced, created, encountered, and used by activities, which, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the, the same pattern, but uh, reduced um, slightly, with activities are still in the center. Um, but. Uh, yeah, there's also these connections um, between the physical and the um, conceptual. Okay, but we are here to talk about design choices and lessons learned. Um, so that's the, that's the sort of introduction half. The second half, I want to hopefully convey some of the things that we, we chose and some of the things we learned along the way of building, uh, of building Lux. The first one is risk versus reward. And then we'll talk about some uh, you know, data completeness versus usability, and um, you can imagine which side of that choice that we came down on. A document database versus a graph database, uh, open source versus licensed product, how to deal with queries uh, and standards, and then finally, um, you know, should we have a big tent approach with everyone, or should we have nimble teams that maybe don't have all of the information at hand? All right, the first one, risk versus reward. So there was this wonderful meeting um, in which one of our curators, Mark Mitchell, the curator of American paintings and sculptures, said to us, I don't want to see another blacklight website. So blacklight is a sort of well-known tool that you can layer over top of solar. Uh, it does facets and searches, and every time you go to a library website, you see a blacklight instance. It's like, oh yeah, I know how to use this. It's blacklight with some basic theming done on top of it. And he was sick of it. He just was, don't, come on, we can do better than this. So, of course, there's risks um, to take uh, in order to not do the tried and true method. Um, scale, right? 41 million records, it's not small. Um, there are 2.2 billion triples uh, in the system. Um, so, also, uh, also not small. Uh, and the team size, so in uh, ITS, I'm in the collection side, but the ITS was more of a service um, who, we, who we used to, for development. Um, they only have five people uh, that worked on this for two years. So there was, there was risk um, involved to be, uh, to be managed. Also just reconciliation, it's a hard process, uh, it's a hard uh, thing to manage. And then there's been uh, very valid concerns over using other people's data because are we, Yale, somehow endorsing their view, but it's a computer making the decision as to what to include. And our choice was to go the risky option, 
um, as you've seen, uh, but with a fallback plan. So if uh, things didn't work out as we had hoped, we always had something that we could uh, fall back to, even if that ended up being functionally equivalent to a, a black light uh, instance. So we were very happy uh, when COVID came along because uh, it gave us an extra year of time. Um, the university said, well, it's going to be hard to do anything with everyone spread out and they're used to working together. All projects, you, can, you, know, you don't get any more money, but you can spend another year uh, of time to uh, come to completion. And we have great support from both the, the CIO and our vice provost to push the boundaries, to try to build something novel uh, and more useful than, uh, than Blacklight. We did manage our risk uh, reasonably effectively with uh, initially some very extensive research into what products were available um, that might be able to fill the, uh, fill the need. We had six teams uh, of two to three people each investigate one particular product and they had, I think, two months to get to some conclusion, is this, is this viable or not? Um, and we, we tested open source software, we tested uh, multiple different um, licensed software, uh, and so on. Uh, and that, yeah, that was, that was very important. So then we also, once we decided on what our platform was, we built everything iteratively. So every two weeks or every, every four weeks for, for big milestones, uh, we would go back to the committees, to the stakeholders, and say, this is what we've done. Is this what you expected us to be doing? And that was critical, because they would often say, what have you done? That's not what that data means, which was great, because then you know, we could quickly uh, iterate and make, uh, make corrections. So we were constantly prioritizing and, and course correcting back into where we should be. We built the critical features first to give us that fallback plan, uh, position. You know, we could just stop building if it stopped, stopped working. Data completeness versus data usability. If you have heard me talk uh, ever in the last six years, you will have seen this slide, I'm sure. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's valuable. So I, I think about um, data completeness and data usability on a, on a scale like this, um, whereby uh, if you've got no completeness, you know, it's just you know, simple Dublin core is probably around here. Right? You've got some data, but it's not very usable for most of the things you want to do. The AAAF presentation API is really usable and you've got a reasonable amount of data, but you don't, it's not semantic, it's just presentational. So it's sort of somewhere up in here. And then as you add semantics, you start the slow decay uh, down to here where you're trying to model absolutely everything you know. You know. Some person thought at this particular point in time that this object used to be you know, blah, blah, blah. Right? No one can deal with that, so your usability has bottomed out at zero, you may as well not have done that. So what we're looking for is to maximize the area under the graph. Right? So we don't want maximal completeness, we don't want maximal usability, we want maximal usability times completeness, which is somewhere in here. So this is our target for linked art and for how we use it in Lux. Of course, you know, we decided for usability in Lux um, and use the linked art decisions as our baseline. Um, some additional ones that uh, decisions we made, we did not try to align uh, textual statements and structured data. So materials, for example. We have indexes, you know, indexed materials, you know, it's made of canvas, it's made of oil paint, and we have a material statement that says oil on canvas. And those are two separate things, they are not linked in any way, because that is really hard in JSON as opposed to XML. There is no meta-metadata, so data about the metadata about the object. Um, so there's no statement level provenance, and we don't know which of the external sources any particular thing comes from, but we do record record uh, level provenance, so we know which, which sources were used, we just don't know which statement came from which. Because if we did that, it would have been 10 times as many triples, and 20 billion triples is, yeah, crazy. There's also no structured uncertainty data um, for similar reasons. There's a couple of sort of hold your nose ontological cases where the ontology didn't really match as well as we would have liked, or the system made it uh, much harder to make the correct choice. So animals are people, which is great if you're Scooby-Doo, but not so great if you're Lassie. Um, <clears throat> and fossils are human-made objects, which if you're a, a butterfly with a human-made pin stuck through you, well, okay, maybe it's human-made. But if you're a fossil that was just dug out of the ground, yeah, less so. But you know, it's, not, it's not disastrous. 
Here's an example. It's a card table from the art gallery. So you can see they've indexed mahogany. But it's important to also show this description because it's not just mahogany, it's also black cherry and yellow poplar. So all of the units have incomplete data and imperfect data, and this is, this is just one of many cases. <coughs> or uh, the, um, the place, right? So they list it as being created in Hartford and Middletown. So it, w it wasn't actually moved back and forwards, this card table. Um, but the art gallery made the decision that they want it indexed under both Hartford and Middletown because it was made in, probably made, in Hartford or Middletown. So they want it to match when someone searches for those places. So there's a lot of practical decisions about what will happen when we have a system that has this data rather than is this the absolute truth. Um, because yeah, otherwise we end up uh, dealing with beliefs and we go crazy. Right, the next question was a document database versus um, a graph database. Of course, we need textual search uh, and we want relationships. So we were stuck with a uh, difficult challenge. Uh, you know, can, can we somehow choose both? Because we really, really want both. Yes, we can choose both. <laughs> uh, so there's a, a set of products called multimodal databases that have both a, a triple store, a graph database engine, and a text database engine. Um, we chose MarkLogic uh, for, uh, for that uh, part. It gives us the best of both worlds. There are, of course, some challenges. It actually took quite a while to get, get the screenshot because it's, it's, it's a little bit slower than the regular facets, but um, not so slow that you can quickly drag the mouse around. So the, fa the top facets are fast, but the bottom two load more slowly because they're semantic. So they go through uh, multiple records in order to determine the counts. So they can take a little bit longer to load. Also, we do need that full normalization that I was talking about for incremental updates. So if there's any degree of denormalization, e.g. some information from, from one record is copied to another, and the record that had the information copied from was updated, we would also need to update all of the records that it was copied to. So if someone, God forbid, added a name to the, to the books record, we would then be updating 12 million other records just to add that uh, information in, across. Uh, data completeness versus system performance. So if anyone has used a relational database uh, or any graph database, um, you will know that fewer joins means faster system. But with linked data, you have many, 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 many joins, and when you have activities separating out all of the nodes, you have even more uh, joins that you need to do between uh, records in the system. So, for example, uh, to get from object to its creator, if you follow all of the links, you'd go from the object produced by production, that production has a part, which is the, the role that that creator played, uh, it used a particular technique, and it was carried out by the person. So, one, two, three joins. But we decided that because what the user needs to know is who created this, this object, we would create a synthetic connection from the object directly to the, the, to the creator. And we would then not be able to search by technique because you know, we've elided it. Uh, but that's okay because we didn't have any requirement to search for individual roles via technique and person. It also means uh, no sparkle endpoint. And that's okay, because uh, as you know, sparkle endpoints are, you know that sparkle endpoints are being used because they're down. Uh, the open source versus licensed product, you know the answer to this one already, but to, um, to clarify, there was a great desire to use open source products the whole, throughout the whole stack, so that we could just say, here you go, Oxford, here you go, anyone else. Here is all of the tools that you need uh, to reproduce what we've done. The choice ended up being not open source versus license, but build and maintain a, an optimized system that could do the connections between records uh, and, uh, and the graph, or license a commercial product that already does that. And at the licensing cost, it was less than a software engineer per year, and it would take more than one software engineer to manage this, so the, the financially sane choice was we should just license a product. It also means that then we had that software engineer to do something else, uh, such as focusing on the value that we can add rather than having to implement a you know, commercial grade uh, software. Harvested data versus federated queries. So 
Uh, this is a, a real choice. Um, if you harvest, then the system is fast because it's got all the knowledge centrally, but everything is always out of date to some degree. Um, it does mean that there's no need for the, all the systems to have the same capabilities. All they need to do is say, here is the changes that we've made to our records uh, over the past hour or past day or whatever the, the period is. If you use federated queries, where instead you don't have any knowledge centrally and you distribute the queries and recombine the results, uh, everything is current, it's all up to date, but it's much slower, uh, even on a single uh, campus, uh, because you have to make all of these network connections. It also makes faceting practically impossible. So we chose, of course, harvesting because the um, descriptions in the, um, in the databases are not updated you know, second by second. It's not a financial ledger where if you are out of date, you've got, uh, you've got problems. And secondly, end users, you know, usability-wise, they care about search speed. If it's more than six seconds to do a search, they are gone. So we wanted to ensure that even if the, the knowledge was slightly out of date, it was attractive and useful and usable to the end user. So overall, our architecture, it's not a technical talk if there's no architecture slide. Uh, we have our systems of record at the top, uh, along with the external databases. They are harvested um, nightly. They're then, uh, particularly the external ones, are transformed into linked art, but there's also some tweaks that we make to the, uh, the records from the internal units. We then do the reconciliation with a bunch of indexes. Uh, we re-identify them, and this is an important step that we, we only realized uh, you know, a little bit of time into the project that we needed to do. We couldn't pick any identifier uh, to just say, right, we're going to use IAT, or we're going to use Library of Congress, or we're going to use the library's identifiers for, for everything. Because there's always records that have multiple identifiers, and no system has identifiers for everything. So instead, we made our own identifiers. Uh, but we maintained that map um, of you know, this AAT, this Library of Congress, this internal record, maps to this um, LUX identifier. Then once everything has been re-identified, we can merge the records together. So we, we maintain caches of all of Wikidata, all of Library of Congress, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, map the ones that we need, and then merge them together uh, towards the end. We can then load them into ArcLogic, and then the user goes to the front end, which then has a middle tier um, back end service, which can do AB flips to say, oh, there's, you know, we want to send 10% of the users to, to B while we're testing something, um, or you know, A has gone down completely, which happened on our second day. Uh, we quickly corrected it. Um, but at the time, there was no real user impact because we could instantly flip over to B, which is a parallel copy uh, of exactly the same system. Everything is cached, and here there is also CloudFront um, because we run in AWS. All right. So these guys, um, the related um, lists, how, if you've got only rec uh, relationships going in one direction, how can we generate these? We could do it either by static lists, you know, compute everything up front, or we could have the front end generate queries, uh, which then is a technology, technology dependency. Our solution was instead to use named query URIs in the record. Uh, we use a, um, a standard called the Hypertext Application Language, uh, and then non-semantic links. These are links uh, for the front end to use, um, rather than uh, being um, part of the discourse. This made it faster and easier to build the application, because our front end software engineer, who's only three years out of college, did not need to understand how to build the queries, she just follows the link, or the, the system that she built just follows the links uh, to get the results. So you know, if you like curly brackets, you know, it's just here is the name, Lux, uh, agent created published work, and then the, the URI which does the query, they get back a standard set of results, they can put it into the accordion. Now there's one component that does everything rather than 26 million components, one for each. Uh, almost done. Custom APIs versus standard APIs. You know, standard API probably doesn't do everything you need, but a custom API, well, no one else uses it, so you've got a lot of technical debt to maintain. Our choice was both, but uh, over time. So at the moment we use a custom API uh, because we want to track uh, metrics, um, which is harder to, to do in a standards-based API, 
But um, now that we've launched, we're sort of migrating over to a standards approach so that other people can also use the, uh, the system. And then uh, finally, a sort of big tent versus nimble team. So the big tent approach is you get as many people as, as are interested or can spare the time, even if they've got totally conflicting ideas, and you get them all together. And you know, this is great for building requirements lists, uh, for buy-in, for stakeholder awareness, and, and so on. So we have we do have some big big tent style things um, where there's you know, a metadata group, and of course there's different opinions about what metadata should look like. Uh, but it is slow to come to consensus, and you end up with a dilution of, of the vision. We also have nimble teams. Um, so there are you know, few focused people with specific tasks uh, over a, um, a specific time frame to accomplish some goals. But the issue, of course, is that those nimble teams, while they get, might get stuff done, suffer from myopia from not having the, the vision of everyone. So we've done both. Um, you know, the thematic committees uh, everyone is welcome to, whereas the actual development uh, is done by small uh, teams with uh, short-term goals informed by the, uh, the bigger thematic committees. One thing to stress is uh, it was important that uh, we could separate the requirements from the product development. So the people who are setting the requirements say, this is what we want, and then it's up to the development teams to build it and say, is this what you wanted? But the stakeholders, the you know, curators, etc., don't tell the developers, you need to do this. They say, this is what we want as a result. Because that way leads to madness. So our governance model uh, is that the um, collecting units in ITS have shared responsibility, but there are clear lines of, of um, sorry, shared ownership, but clear lines of responsibility. So ITS is uh, responsible for the, the system, whereas the units are responsible for the data. So, in summary, we went for risk, we went for usability, uh, both document and graph, uh, system performance because that's end user usability. We needed to use a licensed product because of we needed end user, uh, user performance. Harvest the data, same reason, named queries for the developer's um, uh, experience, migrating from custom to standard um, in terms of APIs, and uh, both big tents and, uh, and nimble teams as appropriate um, throughout the, the process. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'll be very happy to discuss um, anything that you would like to, uh, to know, further, know more about. So um, thank you very, very much, Rob. That's a, a brilliant, I think, whistle-stop tour of what is many, many person years of work uh, overall, both in Yale and beyond in the community. Um, to, if people have questions, could you just say uh, who you are and, and perhaps shortly what your, your role is, perhaps to give some context to where the question is coming from. But questions to Rob. I have a question. I'm Amy Wadamay, um, Assistant Director of the Bobby. Did you do any manual intervention on the data, or was it all nope. automatic? So we have, <coughs> or had rather, it's just finished, um, a Mellon funded um, grant that's, uh, through which we employed six students over three years, and not the same six over the different, but you know, six, six per year. Uh, and they worked with the uh, systems of record to add identifiers into those systems of record for um, sort of high visibility uh, people and places and, and concepts. So there was a, some manual reconciliation um, for, to a single system at the beginning, but then the automation picks up after that to then do the connections. Um, and it also gives us a sort of gold standard to test other reconciliation if it's against. So we do name-based reconciliation as well in the, um, the process, because not every subject has a in the mark records have a, a dollar zero, you know, the identifier um, for the uh, for the entity. So, but uh, the library is very good at using LCSH um, exactly um, uh, as 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 written. So we can do sort of exact match names. Uh, against the external vocabularies uh, when we know that that vocabulary is used by that particular unit. Uh, so then we could then test, you know, how often does this go wrong um, based on the uh, 
the sort of gold standard of the the, the human annotators. Um, and of course, when you're only doing exact matches and everything else is you know is left alone, uh, the accuracy is very high. You know, there is the occasional one. Um, London, you know, places. If if it's just just the place name, we have to be really careful that we're not you know, you know, matching Paris, Texas, or you know, London, Ohio, or yeah. You know, yeah. Really? Hey. Yeah, it's a great question. So, one of the one of the questions that we've been discussing you know, back and forth over the development of the of the project um, <coughs> has been: when do you use the collection system of the unit, and when do you use locks? So, we strongly believe that uh, every uh, every unit, every every collection should have their own specific um, site. Uh, and that Lux is sort of the overlay, it's the merger of many rather than a replacement for, uh, for those many. Uh, because of the 90% rule, right? So um, we, we have done a pretty good job, I would say, of mapping um, you know, the vast majority of all of the fields and all of the systems into a consistent and, and coherent view. But not everything gets through perfectly, right? Um, if there is specific museum knowledge uh, that just doesn't fit into the, the overall schema, um, then we can't include it. Um, but that is thankfully rare, at least at the moment. Uh, or if you know that you, know, you were at the, uh, the Peabody Museum and you know that you saw the dinosaur and you want to see it, well, why would you search everything for it when you can go to the Peabody's collection site and be you know, taken to it much more quickly, much more effectively? So yeah, there's, there's, you know, there is value to, to uh, having them all. That said, in building Lux, we have seen a lot of the units go, hmm, Lux sure looks better than our site. <laughs> what can we do? So there have been two um, different approaches, actually, to that question. Um, the Yale University Art Gallery took the records that they sent to Lux, and also via the activity streams, via the harvesting approach, um, a company in London, actually, um, uh, COGAP, built a new website for them using the uh, exact same records that go into Lux. So if you go to the Yale University Art Gallery site, that is the same data as is in Lux. The Peabody have uh, deferred a lot of maintenance on their collection site, I'll put it politely, uh, and um, their perspective is um, instead of trying to manage something themselves, what they want to do is take Lux, re-theme re it, and then reduce the um, amount of data that is being searched in any given search to only the Peabody records and the other records that relate to it. So that's our, uh, part of the next phase of work, is to make that possible so anyone can say, here is the, the paintings subset, or here is the Peabody subset, or here is the... Um, archives plus paintings plus, you know, etc. Uh, to s partition out information into separate uh, searchable coherent um, catalogues, which will then allow the Peabody to very quickly produce something that looks like Lux or you know, relatively like Lux, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, but is specific to their collection. Can I yeah, of course. So, yeah, sustainability, <laughs> right? Uh, so the benefit of having um, really great internal support um, for the project 
is that it's really not a project, it's a product that we've built. And now we, uh, we know that we have the responsibility to maintain it. And the, uh, the governance model is then designed to facilitate that. So ITS is responsible for maintaining the system and all of the hardware and software infrastructure. And the units uh, chip in to the, uh, what? between ITS and the, the four units, they each pay 20% uh, of the hardware um, you know, and licensing costs. Then we are very fortunate at Yale to have what we call pillars within ITS. So there is a cultural heritage IT pillar, there is a, a financial systems and HR you know, business systems pillar, there's a research pillar and, and so on. So we have um, a dedicated team of the, the five people um, to not just do Lux, uh, but to also implement AAAF um, systems, the other digital asset management, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, we have in ITS a, a core group um, that is, uh, is looking after it. And now they're, they're not project funded, they're, they're core funded. So you know, we're happy that there is the expertise uh, in-house to move this forwards uh, and keep it running. So there is definitely value. Let me tell you where the value is not first. <laughs> so we, uh, we tried using um, you know, large language models, chat GPT, et cetera, uh, to help with the reconciliation um, problem. You know, can chat GPT, for example, uh, tell me what the identifier in Wikidata is for this particular person? Or what's the accession number at the National Gallery for this painting? And it comes up with a very convincing and completely wrong answer. Yeah. You know, it knows what Wikidata identifiers look like. You know, queue, numbers, numbers, numbers. It knows even what accession numbers are in individual museums. And they're all wrong. So that, no, we, uh, we quickly uh, went away from that. But in terms of um, as a data source for um, uh, you know, AI or machine learning of any sort, yeah, we do think that this is important. Um, and it's part of what we're trying to explore in uh, the Enriching Exhibitions project. Of if we can feed into uh, machine learning systems both the full text of the, um, the exhibition catalog <coughs> and the structured data, you know, is it able to pick, a, pick apart the text of the, of the exhibition catalog and align it with the structured data from the uh, collection management systems? Equally, we did some experiments uh, with trying to teach uh, large language models how to build advanced search um, and then hooking it up to um, speech recognition. So you, know, you could say to the computer, uh, find me objects by either Trumbull or Constable. And it could make the query some 80% of the time it got it right um, with enough prompt engineering to, to tell it what to do. Um, and the, yeah, the, the speech to text recognition was amazing. I guess you know, with Siri and uh, Alexa and all the rest of it, uh, you know, that part is, is pretty much solved. So yeah, the one time that was like, I sort of wanted to back away was uh, you know, uh, Constable or, or, um, or Turner. And the query that it generated was objects by, you know, created by either Constable, comma, John or Turner, comma JMW, and I didn't tell it you know which constable or which Turner, but it could it you know it knew the context and could add in the uh, the details. So yeah, there's definitely possibilities, uh, particularly if we can train uh, on the data, so it really would know. Oh yeah, if you're looking for Turner and constable, that's clearly art. We should use these people rather than you know, Fred Turner and uh, Joe Constable. Um, that would, be, that would be amazing because one of the aspects that we think is the hardest of the system is understanding how to put together the advanced search with all of the relationships. Um, you know, we've, we've done our best, there's examples, there's contextual help, but um, yeah, if there was something that we could train, uh, not a, a librarian, um, to help folks to build those, that would be, that would be great.
So thank you. I, I see there's another couple of questions, yep. but um, we're out of time uh, at this point. But Rob, I think you'll be happy to take questions mm -hmm. uh, you know, a little bit of time after the talk. So yep. just to finish up and thank Rob once again for that really illuminating talk. Yep. And yep. thank you all for coming. Yep. Thank you.